the very first item I made from scratch that eventually launched this whole project was making a sandwich, which included growing my own wheat, collecting ocean water to make salt, milking my own cow to turn it into butter, extracting honey from a beehive, this project ended up going viral, likely because of the novelty of actually knowing exactly what goes into the food you're eating by doing every step firsthand. But the bread I made wasn't the best and was one of the factors that made the overall sandwich less than perfect. It's not bad. It's about it. It's not bad. Six months of my life were not bad. Much better tasting bread from the store is made a bit differently and includes a bunch of ingredients whose origins are a bit less clear. If you look around, you'll find articles claiming the bread contains weird additives, such as sawdust, drywall, human hair, or yoga mats. After having gotten so hands-on before, this made me curious. What's in our bread? And why is it there? To find an answer, I'll be learning the basics of bread making from a baker. Hi, I'm Steve with Bakersfield Flour and Bread. This is John and Liz, we're Baker Millers visiting a food scientist to learn what these chemicals are for. We're here to look at what's in bread. And then making my own homemade bread filled with additives next to one that isn't to see just how much of a difference it actually makes. Let's get started. First, the most important ingredient, flour. The key and most important thing is flour. And that's why we mill all of our own flour. So in wheat, you have uh, endosperm, germ, and bran primarily as the three components. Most uh, industrial white flour ha does not have the germ in it. It's been removed. Can you explain the reason why we want white flour? Why do we separate them? I wish I knew. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the beginning, it was uh, the queen who wanted something that was pure. With a cleaner appearance to the white flour, it also gives it a longer shelf life by removing the nutrients that come from the germ that would normally cause it to go rancid sooner. Generally, weed is one of the more nutrient-dense food items on the planet, but we as a culture have taken all of those nutrients out, hence that's why part of the reason why nutrients are added back in. I mean, you know, bread was not enriched, and we actually made a requirement that bread has to be uh, fortified back in the 40s uh, after finding that soldiers were uh, deficient in many nutrients. A little bit different for us is our white flour contains the germ in it. You don't bleach the flour then? Oh, no, no, we don't bleach anything. We don't add any bleach or potassium bromide or anything like that. That means you don't have to re-enrich it. It still has all the nutrients exactly. in it. Exactly. In contrast to large, mass-produced bakeries, Mike bakes his bread without special additives. His ingredients are relatively simple. Salt and sugar, mostly just for flavor. Primarily, it's just to for a sweetener, just to cut a little bit of that acid flavor that's coming from the Levans and oil or fat to improve texture and taste. One of the things is, of course, mouthfeel and, and, and texture. So you're looking for something that's a little bit richer in terms of that, but also in terms of flavor. And of course, the yeast for leavening. Here at Bakersfield, we do everything naturally leavened, or what most people think of as sourdough. So for us, the next most important ingredient is really our Levon for our cultures. One of the biggest factors in bread making is getting just the right consistency to your dough. For Mike, a major way that he can achieve this goes back to what type of flour he uses. Right now we're using six different flours from whole grain wheats to sifted or bolted flour, which basically produces our white flour, and then also whole grain rise and whole grain spelts. What difference do the different types of flour make to the bread? Depending on what you're trying to accomplish, you may want a loaf that's somewhat elastic. In a lot of cases, people start with high gluten or higher protein percentage. So elasticity is really the amount of strength, the amount of snap back in a sense, and extensibility is the amount of give, but still with some strength to it. You wanna be on that continuum somewhere. You don't want one or the other. You usually want some, some balance of it. However, in mass-produced bread, this is often achieved with a variety of different additives. Uh, we want a certain extensibility so that when you're gonna bake the bread, especially commercial white bread, they're all the, exactly the same height and stuff like that. That's done by ensuring the wheat that you're going to be using is going to have the right extensibility properties that when it's made into a dough. So a lot of these ingredients are used for um, improving the dough consistency and elasticity and getting the right texture. Uh, why is that being added to the store-bought bread where like a baker using more natural ingredients doesn't need them? You no, know, it ensures that what you're going to make is going to be the same thing over, the peri over a year. Yeah. You know, so it's just for consistency yeah, For mostly? consistency, yeah. Okay. This desire for a mass producible, consistent product is achieved through a variety of ingredients that act as emulsifiers. Many of them are also able to extend the shelf life of the bread, such as mono and diglycerides. 
Sodium sterolactylate. Yes. <laughs> that it's used as a emulsifying agent. So it, it can form around bu air bubbles okay. and protect them from collapsing. Yeah. Okay. Or it can disperse around fat and, and keep the emulsion spread out through the whole piece of bread. Okay. So you don't have a big oil pocket. Another common one is where the origin of the wood shavings myth comes from, MCC. They are not doing it from wood, okay? They're doing it from other, other sources. It's actually microcrystalline cellulose. It's also in apples, yeah. in celery. Why is that cellulose added to bread? For water holding capacity. Okay. Bread itself holds water, but sometimes it's not enough for the right consistency a manufacturer desires. So they add MCC to add a little bit more bulk. It also acts as emulsifier and is an excellent source of dietary fiber. Another ingredient is calcium sulfate, often found in drywall or plaster of Paris. What purpose is it serving in bread? One of the key things with the protein is the interaction between proteins, and so the calcium can uh, bind between two proteins and help in building the elasticity. In other words, it improves the elasticity of the dough. There's no health issues with No calcium. health issues, yeah. Most people don't get enough calcium. So it's actually a health benefit then. And then there's the amino acid L-cysteine, commonly claimed to come from human hair. There's also claims that like, they're putting human hair in our food. It's not there for flavor, it's not yeah. there for nutrition, it's there because uh, it's a natural mm -hmm. amino acid uh, and it has uh, uh, again, we're, we're playing with the protein to make sure we get the right elasticity. And that amino acid is sometimes uh, extracted from human hair and feathers? Well, you could do it that way. You could make it uh, synthetically. Okay. It's easy to make it. Yeah. So oftentimes when you're buying bread, it's not literally contained human hair? It's probably... No, it's not, not going to be human hair. It's okay. going to be pure cysteine. Most of it is uh, made by uh, biofermentation, so it's made from natural products. I mean, if they, if they were putting hair in there, mm -hmm. they'd be violating some of the adulteration yeah. rules for food. Then lastly, a mold inhibitor. One preservative I oftentimes see in bread is calcium propionate. Mm -hmm. um, does that have any health risk? Well, pro propionic acid is a normal acid. It's, it's in our bodies and, mm -hmm. and a calcium propionate slows down the growth. Uh, that is, uh, that's the best one for bread and it's a safe compound. Bread is uh, got a fairly short shelf life, you know, seven, 10 days, something like that. The ingredients that are used, one, is, which is a very important one, is uh, to add something that's gonna prevent mold growth or at least slow it down. You could irradiate the bread, that would kill the mold and give you a longer shelf life, but people don't like irradiation. Yeah. Is no. there any negative health effects with there's irradiation? No, there's no, oh. no, not the, not the levels that you would use for yeah. uh, hmm. uh, bread itself. With these additives, a consistent, more shelf-stable bread can be mass-produced. However, for small-scale bakers like Steve, they are able to forego using these additives, but it comes with extra challenges. The mixing and kneading of the dough becomes a much longer process, and his fermenting process also becomes more complex. It depends a little bit on what it is, how long we mix it, um, and then how long that primary fermentation is. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the doughs will sit for an hour and a half to two hours, some will sit for four or five hours, some go sit on the floor in a sense for an hour or two and then we bulk retard them. Bulk retarding just means it sits in a much cooler environment overnight, developing very slowly. Okay. Some of our doughs are mixed, fermented, shaped, and baked same day, and some are mixed, shaped, then retarded overnight. So we have kind of three different processes that we're doing for different types of breads, depending on what we're trying to achieve. Generally, additives that are, are you'll see on, a, on many types of packagings for bread are there for shelf life purposes, primarily. I tend to think that that's not necessarily the desired product that most people would want to eat if they actually understood what they're eating. Yeah, uh, so without additives, your bread has a shorter shelf life. Like, yes. How long does it last? Depends on the bread, but some yeah. of our breads will last four or five days and they're quite, quite similar to what the first day. Not quite the same, but, mm -hmm. but most of the breads I would say are in that three to four day range where they still have a pretty good texture, they're still moist, but they do start to break down. The air starts to cause them to dry out, you start to get some staling. Now, having learned a ton of what goes into making bread and having heard two different perspectives on the additives, I'm now curious to put it to the test and make two comparison loaves, one with just natural ingredients and one with additives. 
is mono and dye something flakes. This I want eight grams of soy lectin. Eight grams of wheat gluten. Sodium steroil lactyl lacto. And then MCC. The wood pulp. This is the gypsum calcium sulfate. Get under a gram. I'm going to assume that's close. All right, this one is citric acid. Blast, the man-made stuff, we have calcium phosphate. So I've gathered all my ingredients and measured them all out. And what I have here is a variety of different additives that can possibly be added to your bread. Collecting all of them is a little bit difficult. You can't really get every single additive at a consumer level, so it's pretty limited. So this is mostly just what was available to me. Actually, the hardest thing to get was high fructose corn syrup. It's only available on huge quantities. I wasn't quite ready to buy like a tanker full of it. The other thing to note is the calcium sulfate, which is actually something I sourced in Arizona. The rest of these require somewhat of a complicated process, so I wasn't able to naturally source and create all of them. All right, so I have all the greens here. I'm gonna start mixing them all together. So I have the two loaves here. I have the regular bread and then the bread with all the added additives. So let's uh, throw them in the oven, bake for 50 minutes and uh, see how they turn out. So what I have here are the two different loaves. I have the one with all the additives and the one without. Kind of against what I expected is that the, the additives actually made it a lot flatter. And I'm surprised by that because uh, a few of the additives were supposed to be leavening agents, but there are a few things that are supposed to help feed the yeast and make it rise more. So I'm actually surprised it ended up denser. And the reason for that might end up being that my recipe is not very exact. Might have had the pH wrong, might have had too much water, or any variety of other things because I, I didn't have a real good recipe to work off of. But preservative wise and everything and taste, theoretically, should still be comparable. And uh, now let's let's try some of it and see how they compare. The real stuff. Fairly dense, but not too bad. Nice uh, fluffiness to it. Pretty good white bread. Try the additive stuff. So the bread doesn't really taste like off or anything. There's a huge contrast. It's hard to describe though, because it, like, it still tastes like bread. It's almost like a little extra sweetness and a little extra tartness. The denseness of it is definitely less ideal and is uh, probably what would make me prefer this, but taste-wise, I'd say probably about equal. They both are pretty good. Texture-wise, I would say the non-additive bread was a lot better, but it's not horrible and it's actually pretty good. But now the real test. I'm gonna let them sit for a few days and also see what starts to mold. As there's a preservative here that should prevent mold. Let's cut a few up and see how they age. All right, so it's been three days now and have the bread and I can see the speck of mold starting to form on the non-preservative bread. On the stuff with the additives, no noticeable mold. I'm gonna try some of it, some of it that doesn't have mold on it and uh, see, see how the taste compares now, three days later. I don't know what that yellow stuff is. That could be mold. Let's see, what doesn't have mold on it? Maybe this middle guy. There's specks of mold on him. Definitely moldy. Boy, all right, this guy looks pretty good. Ooh, there's definitely mold on that. I'm gonna try a part that doesn't have mold on it. And just to confirm, additives, no mold. Let's try some. This is definitely stale. I can tell right away, it's stale. It's not hard or anything, but very different from how it tasted fresh. It's not horrible, but definitely not that good. Let's try the additive stuff. It's not bad. I'd say it tastes fresher and there is no mold on this. So I feel a lot safer eating this stuff. Let's let it age a few days more and see what happens. After this test, I left for my trip to Oregon to see the solar eclipse. When I returned, my test samples had gotten contaminated and filled with maggots, both the one with and without preservatives. So to wrap this up, obviously even with additives, bread is not gonna last forever. 
but my rather unscientific test did give me a little insight into what difference the ingredients make to the quality of the bread. Overall, the bread without it tasted noticeably better. A more finely tuned recipe likely would have gotten the additive bread a little bit closer, however. But after a few days, the natural bread was noticeably less fresh and became lower in quality than the one with additives, showing how the additives do help protect against the initial drop in shelf life quality. In addition, I was surprised that a lot of the ingredients are actually there just to make the dough easier to mix and give it a more consistent quality and texture, which was actually the most noticeable change in the bread when I went to mix them. This looks like a very different characteristic. It's like mixing pretty evenly. I got it mixed pretty well just by a spoon. Already a noticeable difference. This important characteristic about bread making is something I never thought about while making single loaves by myself. However, the quality of the properties of flour itself can vary year to year, and these small differences can have huge impacts when you're working on mass-produced quantities. Each year, because of the weather or whatever, the properties of the flour is gonna be a little bit different, and you wanna ensure that you have the right elasticity. Many companies will take the flour, make some dough, and then on this instrument that you see here, we can then pull it apart and see what kind of elasticity it has. So you can use this to compare different flowers. In the end, the fear over these chemical additives seems to be largely unsupported. Pretty much all have been tested and found to be safe. And while their names may sound complex and unnatural, many are actually based on naturally present compounds, with some even adding needed nutrients. In fact, there's even some risk to eating food without preservatives. Earlier you mentioned, uh, I think, black mold. You said that it can cause cancer. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of the concerns people have is that all these additives might cause cancer, but then there's a risk that not having a preservative could give you cancer. Could give you, could, could give you a cancer, right. From what you're saying, it sounds like there's plenty of carcinogens just in natural food. Well, it's the dose that makes the poison. In the end, what makes something toxic is the quantity of it that you are consuming and many of these compounds are carefully regulated to be used in low amounts that are safe. While these additives are safe, fresh natural bread seems to be the best option to take whenever possible. But in my previous video on the challenges of distributing fresh food, I learned how expensive and challenging it can be to distribute items with short lifespans. Using these additives is an important tool to feeding the world as affordably as possible while also reducing food waste. Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of waste. Uh, we waste 40% of our foods. Yeah. either during processing or mm -hmm. uh, including at the uh, retail level and including at the refrigerator at home. So at the end of my exploration, my takeaway is this. Eat fresh, natural bread when you can, mostly because it'll taste noticeably better. But if you can't, more shelf-stable and cheaper bread is probably not going to hurt you and could potentially be safer if the alternative is eating moldy bread. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.